Ten years after William Golding released Lord of the Flies, in June of 1965, six teenage boys found themselves cut off from society on a real desert island. How did they show the world that six Tongan castaways can live harmoniously even when stranded away from it? This is the story of real-life Lord of the Flies. Five, four, three, two, one. Detective Union. Some housekeeping just for the beginning of this video. Super, super freaking unhinged. But I am excited, I guess, in both kind of different ways about this. This is the last time that I will be recording in this place. I'm moving house later on this week, which I am updating you on purely because that means at least for another week you won't have another video. So at least take one week's break, if not like two or more. Keep an eye on the community post. You know I don't like taking multiple weeks breaks. You know that I love doing this as much as some of you like listening to it and I like discovering new stories, researching on them feeding my bloody curiosity about life and just all things morbid. Oh! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Too aggressive? I did not mean to just call you a ho. Um, I just meant to say so, which I say apparently multiple times during the video. Never came out with an H before. Did it? I'm pretty sure you did say ho quite a few times on this channel. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so, my hose, my detective hose, <laughs> what this means is I would very much like you in the next week or two to just share my content, whichever video like spoke to your soul, whichever video got you to subscribe, because then there are chances that you might get somebody else to also subscribe and join me on this journey, because I'm really, really close to monetization, well, the bare minimum that is needed to monetize videos on YouTube, and you know how much bloody work goes into them, because all of my videos are like hour plus long. It's only a few, maybe this one, that will be under that kind of timestamp. But if you are in this world, if you are a content creator yourself, or if you just like deep dives, you know how much time it goes every single week for somebody to compile this type of content for you. So, while I'm gone, please make sure you get as many people on board as possible, and then once I'm back, you know, I can go back to deep dives, reading true crime books, and possibly I will, if I have the balls, okay, this is already not a shortest intro yet, just FYI, if I have the balls, I'm going to post on Twitter, or just anywhere, where do you have subscribe? In the community post in the community post. Well, I'm going to post, okay. So, I will have a power trip of a lifetime. If you manage to monetize me by the end of the week, it will not happen, but listen, if it happens, I will have enough balls to reach out to a certain author of a book on a case that I have covered for this channel. He is British, so might, might be a chance for him to meet up with me in London with my, what, 1,000 subscribers. Hey, I will have the balls to reach out to him and ask him for an interview. Do it. Do it. I would lose my fucking mind. I would, oh my god, I would shit a brick. If the man would say yes to me, I'd shit a brick. Okay, cool. Yeah, will you have the balls to put even a community post up? Do it. Do it. Oh my god, do it. You would like an interview, right? With somebody whose case I have covered clearly as like multi-parter. How sick would that be? How sick would it be if I could turn my channel into actually doing deep dives and then interviewing the people that have already done this kind of research? And he's a researcher. Okay, if I were to reach out to Caroline, <laughs> you already know who this is. You already know exactly who the bloody author is. Okay, listen, <laughs> let's cut this introduction short and go straight into the topic. Lord of the Flies. Have you read a book? Have you watched the black and white 1963 movie on a Friday night while drinking wine and then getting wasted and crying over nothing? Personal story. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have watched that movie a lot earlier. But have you been made to read the book when you were in school? Because I found that to be so weird. So I came here in the UK when I was like 16. So 16 to 18, I was doing baccalaureate, international baccalaureate, which is equivalent to like A-levels. And there, in Serbian class, I believe, I don't think it was English actually, which is 
again, super fucking strange. In Serbian class, they made us read Lord of the Flies and then, like, analyze it, watch the whole movie, and I was just so transfixed by this film because of what it represented. So first, we have to speak about the book, the book by William Golding, for you to actually understand why, when six Tongue and castaways got completely cut off on this desert island, a completely different situation happened that what a lot of people, especially at the time, you know, just a decade after the book has been released, expected. And even today, based off of different theories about civilization, it kind of resonates differently in people's minds, and it shows, like, a better side of life. So this is one of the very few positive videos that you will see on this channel. So, in order for you to understand the story of the day, we have to dive into the plot of Lord of the Flies a little bit. Meaning a lot. Meaning if you don't want the whole plot of Lord of the Flies to be spoiled to you right now, skip to the next timestamp. But uh, I think it's important. I think plenty of people have read Lord of the Flies by now, or you probably won't. Like, if you are in the age range, like, similar to mine, you know, turning 30 this year and shit, you either have read it or you won't. So you might as well stick around and listen to that whole chunk of the video. So what is Lord of the Flies all about? In a nutshell, if I were to describe this book in two lines, it would be about a bunch of schoolboys that were on a plane, the plane crashed, and then stripped of civilization, these boys just revert to savage ways of life. They return to animalistic ways, they go hunting, and they resort to murder pretty quickly. And what the author was trying to make a point of is that humans, when stripped of civilization, are still beasts. They're still completely animalistic in nature, and they would regress to their most primitive state. To break that down in more detail, the book, as I mentioned, follows a plane crash. And the British schoolboys, and especially if you watch the 1963 black and white movie, you can really see that the British accent is quite prevalent. You can see these boys dressed in their school uniforms. They find themselves on this deserted tropical island. There's a couple of characters that immediately become prevalent. And you know when they make you analyze books in school, you kind of have to think, well, what does each and every one represent? You have Piggy, who is the chubby boy with the glasses on, who represents common sense, who represents science, and just the wise ways of life. You have Ralph, who represents democracy, Simon, representing spirituality, and Jack, who embodies all of the factors that are supposed to make the society fall apart. They're supposed to show the other way of civilization, the primitive ways of society. So, two of the boys at the beginning of the movie and the novel, Ralph and Piggy, they find this conch shell. At first, this shell would be used as a trumpet to call all of the other survivors onto the beach. But then, they would have these congregations, they would have these meetings where the boys would just be sitting on the beach, and whoever was to be holding that conch shell would be able to speak, would be able to say anything that they wanted, representing, again, some civilized way of life. Last to arrive, once Ralph and Piggy call everybody, are Jack and a group of choir boys. So the group that were already kind of on Jack's side. After the boys have the initial meeting and have a vote, and all of it is done again in a very civilized manner, they elect Ralph as a leader. And Jack immediately feels not pleased with this decision. So he is instead made responsible for hunting on the island. Because, of course, the first problem of this deserted island becomes how will we get food? How do we start fire? How do we get water? So he starts organizing the subgroup that is called Hunters. Who wants me?
The dynamics are set pretty quickly. Jack clearly isn't happy with Rolf being the leader, but he decides to get on with life for now. They start hunting pigs, because they discover there's actually plenty of pigs on this island, and you immediately see the savagery. They're killing these pigs with their bare hands, with whatever weapon kind of thing that they can find. You can also see the dynamic of them just gathering at that patch of the island where they have the meetings and holding that conch represents civilization. As no adults have survived this crash, it's very clear that the boys have to learn to fend for themselves. And this is when the little ones, who are the younger boys in the group, get scared and they sort of start spreading rumors as to what if there is something else on the island? What if there is a beast? However, it is Piggy, the chubby guy with the glasses, representing kind of common sense, who actually, in a meeting, gets the hold of the conch shell and voices this theory. And he says, well, I have heard of this possible beast on the island. What are we going to do about it? And this is when the whole story, the whole trajectory of the book changes, because suddenly the dynamics change, because you have now both Ralph and Jack thinking from it from different perspectives as to there is a beast and this is now a matter of life or death, we have to protect ourselves. He wants to know what you're going to do about the snake thing. <laughs> Tell us about the snake thing. <laughs> now he says it was a beastie. Beastie? <laughs> a snake thing, ever so big. He saw it. When? When he was hiding in the jungle in the dark. He says, when the rain stopped, it turned into one of them things like ropes in the trees and hung in the branches. He says, will it come back tonight? But there isn't a beastie. I tell you, there isn't a beast. Ralph's right, of course. There isn't a snake thing. But if there was, we'd hunt and kill it. With this dynamic set in place, what you also see is Ralph, who represents democracy, who also has not seen any proof of any sort of beast, apart from just these little pigs running on the island, he denies the existence of it. However, Jack, as part of the tribe, decides to hunt the beast. And, of course, it's two completely different perspectives that then cause more and more animalistic behavior. Because at that point, because at that point, what the book switches from is from surviving to now hunting. Hunting in order to survive, but also hunting the beast. Throughout the novel, especially as they catch their pig, as they catch their prey, you can really see how Jack is turning more and more animalistic. He even paints his face in different colors. He enforces this idea of them while prepping the meal to have like different tribal dances to really celebrate what's going on and to sort of like hype them up more and more about how they will hunt this beast down. And this is when different theories about who or what the beast could be start spreading around. And Simon, who, if you remember, represents kind of spirituality, says, what if the beast is actually inside of us? What if it's just the evil that is inside of us? But Jack here declares that whatever it is, he will find it and he will kill it. As ominous as this is, it's kind of a precedent for the next number of events. So, there was a parachutist that was kind of going over the island and then it unfortunately fell there and the parachutist was dead. However, now Jack, Ralph and another boy will find this dead parachutist and it will confirm everybody's worst fears, that there indeed is the beast on the island. So, Jack, after the argument with the boys about the beast, would leave to hunt further for pigs. And when he kills one, he will leave its head on the stick as an offer to the beast. And that head would soon start to swarm with flies. Hence the title of the book. 
Eventually, Simon, who will also go off on his own, will come across that pig's head, swarmed with flies, and as he's gonna start hallucinating, thinking that the pig's head is talking to him, he will pass out, but he will be the one to actually name the pig's head the Lord of the Flies. Eventually, Simon will actually wake up, and once the hallucinations have stopped, he realizes this is a dead man, it's not a beast, and rushes to tell the others. But as he will come to yet another sort of tribal meeting where everybody's dancing, everybody's hyping themselves up, these boys will be petrified, thinking that Simon is indeed the beast, and he will be killed and then later just let go of in the sea. And now you kind of see the morning after Simon's death, them trying to reconcile with what they have done, and everybody is grieving. And most of the boys by this point would have joined Jack's tribe. So now there's a clear divide between Ralph's and Jack's tribe. And Jack's one will be after Piggy, who of course is on the semi-decent democratic side of things here, and they're after him because of his glasses, because they can use his glasses as matches to light up the fire. Now, just to sort of briefly describe the rest of this book, Piggy will also get killed because they take his glasses, and then obviously members of Ralph's team are going to go to Jack's team to face them, to retrieve his glasses, he's killed by the rock, again, sort of, in an accidental way, because at this point everything is really a power trip, and all of these boys are hungry, hallucinating, just constantly fighting, and resorted to savage behavior. However, at this point, the teams have completely turned against each other, and Jack manages to convince his that Ralph might be the beast, and that he needs to be smoked out. And smoked out here means quite literally. They set the fire to this whole island, and luckily at that point, some British naval officers were passing on a ship, and they spot that most of the island at this point is engulfed in fire. And you see them getting onto the island, and Ralph literally running for his life as everybody is chasing him, and the boys are finally found and saved. And the British naval officers kind of end up in disbelief as to the whole savagery, as to what is going on, how come that after such a short period of time, these boys have resorted to this sort of lifestyle. They're hunting one another. As this is how the novel and the movie end, let us just briefly discuss the themes that are appearing throughout the show. So, as I mentioned, Ralph is seen more as a democratic leader, whereas with Jack, you can kind of see that he is exerting violent dictatorship. In the beginning, they accept each other's leadership techniques. However, because of a completely different set of values, Ralph representing law, reason, protection of the weak, some sort of duty and civilization, and Jack representing violence, cruelty, fear-induced government, tyranny, well, their values clash, and they suddenly have to actually separate into two groups. Conch, as we mentioned, is the symbol of power, and the only value they see in Piggy, the only one who has some common sense, are his glasses. He is only the means to whatever they needed at that point. And as we see the split of these characters, the split between the hunters and the protectors, you see the humanity's violent and savage impulses, represented as something that is more powerful than the civilized manner of living that they have been living just prior to actually ending up on that deserted island. Now, what that means for the ending of the novel and the movie is that Ralph, who was one of the good guys, but also 
all of the other guys, all of the other guys who have turned their back to civilization, are in turn saved by yet another member of the civilized society. And that's the underlining idea that civilization itself is under serious threat from different forces of violence. The writer himself, William Golding, kind of saw his book as a masterpiece, if honest, like from just the few interviews that I have read that he had done at the time, and he really saw it as a scaled-down society. He saw it as a true representation. And he was kind of sexist in, again, multiple interviews that I have seen done. So this is from one of the interviews. He, first of all, yeah, called it the scaled-down society, and then said, if you, as it were, scale down human beings, scale down society, if you land with a group of little boys, they're more like scale down society than a group of little girls would be. He continued, this is nothing to do with equality at all. I think women are foolish to pretend they're equal to men. They're far superior and always have been. But one thing you cannot do with them is take a bunch of them and boil them down, so to speak, into a set of little girls who will then become a kind of image of civilization, of society. Whether or not you agree or disagree with the author of the book, hopefully you disagree with him in some parts, because some of it is really, really questionable, but whether or not you disagree with the main idea of this being a scaled-down society. If humans are stripped of civilization, will they resort to savagery? Will they resort to the behavior that is displayed in the book? Ten years, or rather almost eleven, after he released Lord of the Flies, six teenage boys would find themselves stranded on a real desert island. Completely uninhabited as well, as we are gonna learn in a minute. And like in the book, there were no adults. It was just these teenage boys, and it was up to them to survive. So let us dive into the story of the day that happened on 18th of June, 1965. Well, it started happening then, because if you listen to the intro, they will be stranded on this island for 15 bloody months. So six boys from Tonga, they were between the ages of 15 and 18, decided to just have an adventure. What I mean by that is they were in a Catholic boarding school that's called St. Andrew's College, and it is in the Tongan capital of Nukualofa. Nukualofa is just sort of like the most northern point from what I have seen on the Tongan island. I will be putting maps here and there just for you to see exactly what's going on, because once you see it through the maps, you realize just how insane this story truly is. I couldn't find much in the Catholic school. I really wanted to know, like, what do they mean by super strict Catholic school, especially at the time. The multiple articles that I could find, kind of, there's only one paragraph about, like, the history of the school, saying that it was founded in 1905 as the primary school, then it was rebuilt in 1971, and that quite a few famous people from Tonga have gone to this school. That the ex-students had some distinguished Tongan men and women, some governmental ministers, clergy, and the present Archbishop of Polynesia. Speaking of Polynesia, Tonga, the island where the six castaways would be living on at the time, would be going to that Catholic school, is a Polynesian country. It's also an archipelago consisting of 169 islands, out of which actually 36 are inhabited, only 36 islands. The population of Tonga is just over 100,000 people. New Zealand, to its southwest, is probably the biggest point of reference nearest to Tonga. And another point of reference is Fiji. And this would be where the boys actually intended to go. Just like any good decision, especially if you are in some strict environment, whether it is your family, whether it is a Catholic school, they made this decision around 2 3 in the morning and they decide to steal a boat with the intention to just go out, sail during the night, you know, then by the morning they will be far ahead in the sea, nobody will be able to catch them. And then their intention was to end up in Fiji. Now, this is 1965, okay? Let's give them some leeway, because I have tried to do math. 
And I realized that this is why I always sucked at it. Between Fiji and Tonga, there's about 804 kilometers. Now, it takes one hour to travel a mile on a super slow boat. Why did I not look up how long it takes to travel a kilometer? I don't know. A mile is about 1.6 kilometers. So, I, this is when I gave up on math, because I was like, I can't make these conversions. And I'm here to tell you that what this means is that between Tonga and Fiji, there is about 400 to 500 hours, give or take. Might be a bit less, might be a bit more. You know, that's where my math is. It's in between those numbers and hours converted to days. It means it's at least 17 days or more, which most probably these boys had no clue that this is how long it would take them on a little sailing boat that they have just stolen from a fisherman in the area. A double take on that, because if they stole the boat from a fisherman, it's not a sailing boat, right? It's it's a fishing boat. But you get what I mean. This isn't like a motorboat. They literally just equipped it with quite a few basics. They only took a couple of coconuts, two sacks of bananas, and a gas burner. They didn't take the compass, which would be kind of useful at the time, or a map, which yet again are the only ways for them to figure out where they are. So once they pack up the coconuts, the bananas, the gas burner, the friends, Sion, Kolo, David, Stephen, Luke, and Mano, just sail off into the night. They sailed about five miles to the north of the island. They did some fishing, because obviously they didn't have any more food to that, and that was probably what the gas burner was for, if you think about it, and then they fell asleep. And as you could imagine, just falling asleep in the middle of nowhere without a map or a compass means that once you wake up, you will have no idea where you are. And not just that, but during their night, the storm breaks out. And the storm broke their anchor rope, destroyed their sail, destroyed their rudder. So, what this meant was the boys are now just drifting. They're drifting for eight days, without knowing where they are, only with that food that they had on the boat, and with no fresh water. The essentials that you need to survive. And what they said at the time in the interviews that I have seen is, they thought we already committed a crime. Like, even if there was a way for us to return, which it didn't seem like there was at this moment in time, we wouldn't really attempt it. If you're like me thinking, well, they had some food, right? But how long can they actually survive without any fresh water? Well, luckily for them, those coconuts turned out to be useful. So they obviously hollowed them out and they collected any fresh water, anything. If any storm was to come along, any rainfall due during the night, they would be drinking that water. So for the next eight days, this boat is just drifting in the sea. They would try to fish, no success. So, just as they're desperate, as their boat is now drifting in the southwest direction, it starts to disintegrate, because there's nothing really holding it on. So, they start to just go into the water, and they're like, well, I guess this is it, because they don't see any land, until they drift yet another 200 miles, and they spot an island. And this would be the Ata Island, when from that point on, they would be spending their 15 months on. Now, why I keep putting these maps in is because this wasn't even anywhere close to Fiji, not even remotely in the direction where they were supposed to be headed on. And Ata Island is interesting in itself. I'm going to put up just like a brief history that I found of it online, but the only thing that you need to know is why it was uninhabited, why this island was deserted and there were no grown-ups, no children, nobody living on it. Small Tongan community lived on this island before, and when I say before, the last signs of life on it were about a century earlier. And they lived there because they were ripped from their hometowns by slave traders. When the king of Tonga heard about the kidnappings, heard about the slave trade, he sent out people in order to resettle the remaining population 
two different islands. So the last ships that were ever on this island were there in 1860s. And as we know now, it was over a century later. The boys now having found this island, they abandoned their disintegrating ship and decide to swim ashore. And when I say swim ashore, they still had from the periphery, from after seeing their island, 36 hours of swimming to do. They used the planks from the boat and these planks would actually be useful to them on there to figure out the time, to figure out how long they were there. So they salvaged those and just used them to sometimes maybe rest, use them to basically swim faster towards the island. Once they were on it, you see, from the picture that is behind me, that is Ata Island, you kind of think it's flat. It just looks like, from the bird's eye view, like a nice, flat, deserted island. No, not really. Because the island had quite a mountain to it. If you look at it from a different perspective, from the side, you can see exactly what I mean. So, the boys immediately decide to explore it, because, of course, they're hungry. After 36 hours of swimming, 8 days of just floating on the sea, they're hungry, they want water, they need to figure out quickly, you know, the essentials. How to start up a fire, what they're working with, is there anybody living on the island, how to start up water. So, they immediately go to inspect it, right, to see if there's any life on it, and they go to the top of the mountain. The climb took two days. Several times they had to turn back and find another way. But eventually, they came to a coconut grove 800 feet above the rocks. Here they rested and regained the strength for the final effort to get to the top. In a ledge at this halfway point up the mountain, we found old-fashioned knives. We cut the tops off young coconuts and drank the juice. We felt we had the spirit of the old people with us. Luckily, as they see what they're working with, they will soon find enough fish, find enough bananas. They even described that they had a whole feast as soon as they arrived. And they also said raw fish, still, to this day for them, because of just how long they spent on this island, makes the best breakfast. As for water here, luckily they didn't have to resort to coconuts, because there was plenty of trees. So they would find the hollow tree trunks, and that is where they would gather all of the water, all of the rainfall. They would come onto the island and then drink it, and then sort of repeat the action to make sure that they gather any rainfall in the evening hours. Eventually, they would make a garden, they would have a badminton coat, all just made from things that they found on there. They even made sort of a house, like a contraption for them to live in, and they found the essentials, as if they figured out how to start up a fire, and the fire, according to them, always had to be monitored. And they made sure that there's always a way to keep fresh water. Something that pops into my head here, unlike in Lord of the Flies, the boys described there were never any divisions. There was no group, you know, no dynamic shifts, anything like that. And here comes my question, because that is one question that I have had when reading through this book and just the theories online. And my question was, okay, it was six of them. So it's quite different. Like, yes, Lord of the Flies is a fictional work. Hopefully there will never be any sort of case where this many people are stranded on a deserted island. But, I mean, there are cases of people stranded in different circumstances. There are cases of the Battle of Paz. There are cases in the past of people stranded in the cold, in the mountains, because the expeditions wouldn't go according to the plan. And people did resort to splitting, to savagery, to possibly consuming each other's flesh in order to survive. And I'm just thinking whether here the case was that there was not that many of them. It kind of crossed my mind, obviously, where this case goes might prove me wrong and you wrong, but it just crossed my mind and I wonder what do you think? Is it because it was less of them? Like, what if it was, again, the full plane? What if it was hundreds of people? Would the dynamics be completely different? Because I think it's kind of different when you're already friends, there's already some sort of friendship established, some sort of behavior established between you, and there's already a bond. 
Like, if this was really school kids, if this was really just random people on the plane, you know, we've seen Lost. Weird shit starts to happen. Speaking of Lost, in the comments, did you watch it? Were you ride or die for this show? Because you discovered it in 2018 on Japanese Netflix after taking a NordVPN code from Eleanor Neal's channel or somewhere, another true crime YouTube. <laughs> And then you have spent every single minute of your already non-existent social life committing to this series and you have no regrets. Personal story, yes. Still the best storytelling. Still one of the very few shows that I wish I could watch for the first time and have all of the feels. Yep, did they lose us for a couple of seasons? Yeah, but still... The other seasons? Brilliant. And I would say even up till the end, I'd say still, I watched it, but the first couple of seasons, bro, that show, whoever was the writer on that show, come to my side, come to this channel. You wish. You fucking wish. Well, here, as I mentioned, unlike in Lord of the Flies, there were just no divisions and no groups. And in an interview for ABC, Mano, one of the boys, says how they ate and what they really focused on immediately from the get-go as they arrived onto the island. He would actually demonstrate how they ate the fish that they would catch raw, and he said other ways to quench the first, especially at the beginning, when, you know, they still had to wait for the rainfall and to use the hollow tree trunks, was to raid the nests of seabirds and to drink their blood and their raw eggs. And he confirms what you and me probably know about desert islands, any food. No matter how awful, it's everything you have at that point. It's delicious, it's beautiful, you're just diving into it, you're just going for it. And you are making sure to make it as best as you can. Meaning, just like in Lord of the Flies here, fire was important. It was the main task of the day making sure that the fire is actually lit up. And the guys in this documentary that I have watched from the time say that sometimes it would take hours. But you can see how that's important. Not just to improve the taste of the food, which is already gross and just raw, and you would have to resort to just eating raw food, but also because then it is the only means of getting, signaling, possibly passing boats to help you out. And you have seen on the map where these boys were. They needed help and they needed it in form of a fire. And this will eventually be how they will be found. But before that, why fire was super important and how they discovered it? Well, once they regained enough strength, Mano and Sion tell the ABC interviews that they would climb up to the island's forested plateau, so like the top of the mountain. Here, they will somehow luckily find a clay pot, a machete, and some chickens. These items were actually left behind by the small Tonga community that lived on this island a whole century before. So once they got to the top of the mountain, enjoyed the nature, they were hit with the realization that they need to use all of the tricks that they have ever learned in order to light up a fire. They said they would never leave it unattended. So this is one thing, unlike in Lord of the Flies and probably unlike in any common sense situation, you would not leave the fire unattended. You're on a desert island, you don't want it burned down. And you also don't want anybody to be smoked out for any sort of psychotic purposes. Siona would say everybody had a duty for the fire. You have to take care of it, you have to say a prayer for that night, and then when you get up in the morning, the fire still needs to be going. Because again, what if somebody is passing during the night? That's the best time for somebody to see smoke, to see fire, and to get them saved. As for water, they would cut the trees for days to make them hollow so they can have some, and eventually, and very fast, they kind of established a roster which would be possibly similar with how you would imagine life on the desert island to be running, and again, similar to the book. They split into teams, but these boys were not splitting into teams in order to hurt one another, in order to hunt for prey, and prey is sometimes meaning humans. Rather, they were building things in order to make their life on the island better. They built a hut that they called a house, they built a garden with bananas and beans, and of course they set up the roster in order to keep a lookout for any passing ships. 
they built a badminton court, as I mentioned, and sort of like even a gym for them to train, because obviously they were between ages of 15 and 18. And most of the time they said that they lived harmoniously. Their roster then suddenly started revolving around the tasks, around the chores. Gardening, kitchen, meaning fire, setup, guard duty for the lookout for the ships, and again to make sure that they're switching during the night to make sure that the fire is alight. Steven would build a fire that was maintained for the rest of the time on the island. Colo managed to build a guitar, and this is fabulous because like, there are pictures of this. He built this guitar out of coconuts, salvaged wood and wire. And it took them some time to get accustomed, but then six months in, it felt like home. Because they had all of these duties to keep their mind occupied during the day, they did quarrel, but then they say they would establish a timeout. If they ever did have any arguments, they'd kind of go their own ways, have a quick walk, and then reconcile. They would pray, and they would also play music. And obviously, like, once there is a guitar, once there's music, the mood completely lightens up. But yet again, comparing it to Lord of the Flies, it's not the tribal energy. It's not a dictatorship. It's just these boys trying to basically forget where they are while keeping up with the chores, making sure they keep their mind occupied, and not just completely lose it due to their circumstances. In the interviews that I have watched, they mention two main anecdotes. One of them is probably the most dangerous adventure that they have gone for. So they would usually go up and down that mountain, whatever you want to call it, in bird catching expeditions in order to get birds, you know, whether it is to drink their blood and like to take the eggs and eat them, or whether it is to catch birds to then have their dinner. After six months, it was beginning to seem like home. But the fickleness of the twins of nature and fate was never far away. One night, a 40-foot tree crashed inches from where they slept. But the nearest they came to tragedy on top of Arta was during a bird-catching expedition. Mano and Steveni had gone to the cliff top to search for seabirds and their eggs. They had two birds and were looking for more. Each day, we hoped to eat two birds each for our meal. Mano came back to the top with his catch, and Steveni decided to go further down the cliff face where there were more nests. Then he slipped and fell. As for the portions, the boys mentioned they would eat two birds each for a meal, daily. So, of course, this was again one of the chores on that roster. And once they went searching for them, well, Stephen was on this narrow ledge and he slipped up. So, for four months, he couldn't walk. But they managed again to somehow make a cast-like thing in order to keep his leg in order, in order to make sure that his leg is stabilized and that he could eventually walk. And when the doctors actually examined him after, obviously, the boys were saved, they said, like, this is just miraculous. Like, how would these boys manage to do this? Like, there was just no lasting damage. He could completely walk fine four months after. The boys would admit that not everything was great at all times, that they would end up being unhappy, obviously, after so many months. And especially if you can imagine if somebody, one of them, then has to rest at all times, can't actually even walk in a place where there's already nothing to do, but they would just have a walk, separate, and then just have time out, basically, and move on. They also use those slates as a rough calendar to count the days and the months that they have been there. And by this time, a few months in, the funerals at their home have already been held. Now, a question pops up maybe in your head whether they have had any escape plans. I mean, after a month of just being on the lookout, following this roster, making sure the fire is running all day long, you kind of start becoming hopeless. So yes, indeed, they have. And luckily, luckily for them, this plan didn't actually go through according 
to how they wanted it to go through. So at some point they built the raft, they found enough wood, they built the raft and they tried to escape, but the raft broke apart pretty quickly, like right at the reef. And this is a good thing because they thought that they were in a different place. They actually thought that they were in Samoa and they planned to sail south, which would have just led them into the open ocean. And the chances of them being rescued there would have been completely minimal. This was, from all accounts, their only escape plan. But whenever they would see a boat in the distance, they would signal fires. However, there would say four vessels, four boats actually sailed past them within those 15 months and none of them had seen them. Until 11th of September. 15 months after they were just cut off from the world, from civilization on that island, another boat arrived. And that brings us to the captain that was manning that boat. And this guy had quite an interesting history, and kind of similar in that rebellious way compared to the boys themselves. This legend is called Peter Warner. This legend was called Peter Warner. And he was born as the youngest son of once the richest and most powerful guy in America, called Arthur Warner. So back in the 30s, Arthur actually had an empire of electronic industries. And apparently it was just radios, right? But radios were pretty big back then. Peter was, again, in a strict household. He was expected to go into radio industry himself, probably to inherit his dad's business. And at the age of 17, he decides, fuck this shit, and he decides to run away from home. Now, he always wanted to man ships. He always wanted to be a seaman of sorts, to be a captain maybe one day. So he went to the sea in search of adventure. He would always say, I prefer to fight nature rather than human beings. Peter spends about five years on the sea. He actually even earns a captain's certificate, rather a Swedish captain's certificate, because he was all over the world. And he knew what he was doing at that point, so he returns home thinking his dad is going to be proud, like he has sort of a degree that would lead to a job of sorts. However, his dad wasn't. He actually forced him to study a useful profession which Peter asked what would be the easiest way around this, because I clearly don't want to do anything else, and his dad said accountancy. So Peter spent another five years just studying accounting to earn his degree. He even went and worked for his dad's company in order to please him. However, he always wanted to be on the sea. He always wanted to be captain. He knew that was his calling. So he decides to go to Tasmania, and this is where he kept some fishing fleet. And as he was fishing on that side, that was what brought him to Tonga in 1966, in the winter, rather, 1966. And what he intended to do was to go to the king in order to ask him for permission to trap a lobster in Tongan waters. But the king refused. So Peter, you know, with his head down, goes back to Tasmania. And on the way, he just like, I don't feel like going home. Like, I don't feel like going back to what accountancy, going back to my dad, going back to work for him. This just isn't what I care for. So he decides to take a little detour. And this would be outside of the royal waters. He just puts his nets in order to catch some fish. And that's when he sees a really tiny island. And that would be the island of Atta. Peter knew this island shouldn't have been inhabited in years, probably a century, don't really know what his history knowledge was here. However, what gave the boys away was when Peter was looking at the cliffs. If you remember the profile of Atta Island, you could kind of see that it is the mountains, it is the cliffs. And he saw the burn patches from all of the fire that the boys have been lighting up for 15 months. And Peter immediately thought, it's very unusual for forest fires to start spontaneously. What if there is a sign of life here? I noticed a black patch against the green background on the hills. I thought, that's strange that a fire should start in the tropics on an uninhabited island. So we decided to investigate further. And after we'd finished our fishing experiment, we went in close to the island. The lookout on the mast said, I hear a human voice. I didn't believe it was a human voice. 
They said, oh, that's the birds. You're crazy. It's not a human voice. So we went closer and closer, slowed down, and we saw this brown figure coming down, jumping down to the rocks and into the sea and doing a very nice swim out towards us. So I said, this is, this is strange, this island. Maybe they keep it as a prison for the worst criminals and uh, cast them out here. So we loaded the, the, the rifles ready to, uh, for whatever it happened. So with his boat, he starts approaching the island. And by that point, the boys who have been on the lookout for this type of rescue for 15 months, some of them start signaling him. They start basically using the guitar, using their voices, making sure that he can also hear them. And one of them starts swimming towards him. The boy that was swimming towards Peter was Stephen. And once he reached the boat, he said in perfect English, my name is Stephen. There are six of us and we reckon we've been here 15 months. And at this point, as he is swimming, he's literally facing people with guns. Because on the boat, Peter has made others load the rifles. Because he doesn't know what the hell, like, who are these people that are just basically bombarding them with sound. And then there's somebody just swimming towards him, and then he sees all of them, like all six of these boys, swim towards the boat. So he's skeptical, of course, he's a smart man. He puts them on board and, you know, they're armed, so these boys can't do them really much harm. So he decides to ring their boarding school in Nukualofa, where they try to escape from. Peter is using the two-way radio, probably produced by one of the companies that his dad owned or worked for, and he said, I've got six kids here. If I give you their names, can you phone the school to find out if their pupils there? Twenty minutes pass, and an operator in tears gets back to Peter, saying, you found them. These boys have been given up for dead. Funerals have been held. If it's them, this is a miracle. As you could imagine, the boys boarded Peter's ship straight away. They went back to their hometown and the whole family. The whole country was just so joyous because they left them for dead. They had their funerals and now all of these boys are returned 15 months after. Along the waterfront, the word was spreading, our boys have come back. Then it was time, time for laughter and for tears, for smiles and words of endearment as the long heartache eased. However, just as they hug their families, as they want to go back to their life yet again, they end up in shackles. Because remember how this story began. They borrowed, quote-unquote, they stole somebody's boat, a boat of a fisherman. And that fisherman wanted to press charges. My man, this fisherman didn't really have any common sense, didn't really pass the vibe check, if you wish, because... These boys have just been celebrating. Their return has been celebrating. Surely there's a way out of them getting a prison sentence from your freaking boat from 15 months ago. Like, there's six boys that have been on a desert island and now they're alive. And of course, Peter here comes to the rescue. He comes up with a plan because he knows now this is a story that has to reach the news. It has to reach the media. These boys are celebrities. They're survivors. They are the six Tongan castaways. He goes to that fisherman. He pays about 150 pounds at that time for that old boat and then calls Channel 7 News in Sydney, saying that you have Australian rights, but let's make this story international. Give me the world rights. And then he's going to spring those kids out of prison and take them back to the island so that Channel 7 can have the original, the initial scoop. The first scoop of, like, how they actually managed to survive for 15 months. And, of course, as soon as the old boat was paid for, and this story made the news that there is a potential documentary here that might make Tongan community famous worldwide, well, the boys were released. They were released on the condition, though, to cooperate with the movie. 
Only a few days after that, the Channel 7 crew made it to Tonga. And it is said that they made it on the aircraft, of course, because it was a one weekly service at the time. And they were all in like suits, completely contrasting the boys that have just been released from prison. But this documentary has indeed been made back in the 60s. And Peter says when retelling this story in the interview that it just looked like the Channel 7 guys did not even know what they were going to face when they went to the island of Atta again. They just, some of them couldn't even swim. And Peter was like, yeah, we'll just take care of that. I mean, the boys are pretty, pretty freaking good at that, considering that that is what quite literally saved their lives. And that brings us into a completely different story about how and why we actually know the story of the Tongan castaways. And that is because of a Dutch man called Rutger Bregman. Rutger is a Dutch historian, and he has written quite a few different books. However, once he was writing the book called Humankind, Hopeful History, he started looking at different perspectives, different insights about well, the books and the concepts that we are familiar with. And he was himself quite hooked on the book Lord of the Flies. So he started writing the article on the subject where he compared Lord of the Flies to modern scientific insights. And he concluded that in all probability, kids would act differently based off of his scientific research. However, his view at the time really wasn't accepted. So when he published that article, the readers were quite skeptical. So he starts researching, well, what if I can find any proof that yes, maybe this story happened in real life? And he's going through different archives of newspapers. He's obviously Dutch, so this story just luckily popped up on his radar. At first, he found a blog post that read, One day in 1977, six boys set out from Tonga on a fishing trip. Caught in a huge storm, the boys were shipwrecked on a deserted island. What did they do, this little tribe? They made a pact never to quarrel. And it was just, like, a really short blog post, so he starts going through even more archives, now going through different libraries and newspapers, and he realizes that 1977 was a typo, because the year here was 1966. Which brings him to the Australian newspaper The Age, and the headline, Sunday Showing for Tongan Castaways. He learns about the six boys, he learns about Peter and his background story, and then he learns that there was a television station that was supposed to film the reenactment of the adventures. So he's, of course, like, are the boys still alive? Can I still see this footage, this documentary? Has it been made? Where is this captain? I need to get the scoop. Luckily, in those newspaper articles, he found a name, Peter Warner, the name of the captain of the ship. So, when he searched for him, he had another stroke of luck. Because Peter Warner was, again, famous from a famous family, he found another headline. Mates share 50-year bond. And mates in question were Peter Warner and Mano Totau, one of the boys that he had saved. So, 50 years after the boys have been rescued, Rutger reaches Brisbane and then reaches Tonga. And he still says when researching for this book, when watching that documentary, when interviewing especially these two, that it always brings tears to his eyes. It's really extraordinary to see this guy, Peter Warner, who is almost 90 years old, and Mano, 70 years old, and they still go sailing together. You always start crying when you look at it again. Rutger would be the one making the world aware of this story with his article for The Guardian in 2020. And then, obviously, after that attention, after that article blew up quite a lot through Twitter as well, they would have more interviews done, especially focusing on Peter and Mano's friendship. Because even after all these years, they still called each other the closest friends. So what happened with the boys, and where does this stand now? So, as you could expect, the teenagers, after being semi-celebrities, having a documentary made on them, they had no interest in going back to their strict Catholic church. At first, they actually worked for Peter, for the captain of the ship, who ended up setting a fishing business in Tonga. Sion, I really hope I'm pronouncing this guy's name right, he became a minister and he was heading the Church of Tonga in the US. 
Mano trained as a chef and he was set to have moved to Australia. And then for half a century, him and Peter have been the best of friends, which is why we are here today. In July 2021 interview, when Mano was asked why do Peter and him still get along so well all these years after the rescue, Mano said, I think that we feel strongly in us that we have something to helping one another, teaching one another on it. Peter contributed to that response by saying, and also we have a common belief that got you through that trial on the island. Love, compassion, and justice, unity. Mano said, we both believe in the same thing. This was, from all accounts online, the interview that Peter might have done the last and a lot earlier in the year, because... I have seen reports that he had passed away, and this is confirmed by multiple articles, in April of 2021. He passed away at the age of 80. And this is so, so bizarre to me. Peter's death was confirmed by his daughter, and it was said that he passed away after being swept overboard by a rogue wave, while he was just sailing near the mouth of a river the area that he had known for decades. This man who had saved these six castaways just passed away, I mean, I guess doing what he loved, but it's just like, I don't know, there's something to it, some sort of irony, some sort of of it, but they didn't manage to revive him, so he passed away on the spot. As for the boys, from the articles online in May of 2020, it was announced that the four of them who are still alive, now men in their late 60s and early 70s, will get the film rights. So this is why this story was circulating in the news. They sold their film rights to New Regency. So there is probably another movie on the horizon to make the public actually aware of this story. And for everybody to see a different side of Lord of the Flies, of that division of people outside of the civilization just resorting to savagery. So the question that we have remaining is, would have the Lord of the Flies happened in real life? Or is the story of Tongan castaways more realistic? According to the research that Bergman had done, the story of the six boys is actually the one that is supported by scientific research. He said that in the past 20 years, scientists from very diverse disciplines, anthropologists, archaeologists, sociologists, and psychologists, have all moved to a much more hopeful, optimistic view of human nature. Bergman's research shows that it's all about survival of the friendliest. So not the fittest, not the meanest, not the people who can hunt, rather people who can cooperate. We can cooperate really well on a pretty big scale. Not only has his research in the area showed that people can work together and survive at the same time, that doesn't need to be blood spilled as it was in Lord of the Flies, but Bregman's work also has the evidence against the veneer theory. Now, veneer theory is the assumption that society, technology, institutions, everything that we consider civilization, quite like in Lord of the Flies, is the only thing stopping people from turning into just violent monsters. Some people believe that veneer theory can explain quite a few things. How we behaved during the wars, how we behaved at the beginning of the pandemic, when the gas prices have risen. And according to Bergman, the power this theory has is because it's very old and it's dominant in Western cultures. The idea here is that our civilization is only a thin veneer, only a thin layer, and that below that veneer, sort of real, raw human nature resides. And that, you know, when something small happens, you know, or big, you know, we're in a crisis or in a pandemic like we're right now, that humans reveal who they really are, that deep down we're just selfish. We are beasts. We we are, may even be monsters. But luckily, we have this civilization that is basically protecting us from from what we really are. On one end, you can agree with this. You can probably even on top of your head think about the examples, some of that that I have just named, that would go along with veneer theory. But what Bergman says is by thinking the worst of others, we also bring out the worst in our politics and in our economics too. And if you flip the coin, if you look at it from a different perspective, you can see it the way one of the castaways themselves have seen this. 
as respecting and loving each other being the key of what pushed these men forward and what has probably saved their lives. And that's how our culture tried to teach us to respecting each other and try to be loved to each other, no matter how hard the life is. And finally, if you zoom out of this story and see it as a bigger picture, what this means is that instead of looking at others as always being savages, as being bad, as other people being evil, and twisting the view to start looking at other people as decent, in that case, you might just create a completely different kind of world. And that is the opposite of veneer theory and what Bergman tried to prove in his book and why this story resonated with so many people. But that is the story of the Tongan castaways. And now I pass it on to you. What do you think about this story? Did it happen differently purely because the group was smaller? Or does it prove that maybe we wouldn't resort to violence and enforcing dominance and that we aren't just inherently evil? You can never pronounce that word out loud, did you? Inherently? 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 <sighs> I'm an immigrant. Get me out of here. What are your thoughts on this story? Make sure you like and subscribe and uh, share. Oh, Jesus Christ. Somebody needs vitamin D. Somebody needs something in her joints. Make sure you share this story in my absence and I will... Be back with a different type of setup, probably just a wallpaper. Maybe I will eventually make a video updating you on why I'm moving and my life situation. Maybe you don't care about it, in which case... Cool! I'll just stick to true crime because um, <laughs> the vlogs aren't my thing. I don't know if you can tell, but I just ramble on at the each and every end of every single one of these videos. But we needed a good story, okay? I needed it. I don't know about you, but I needed a hero story. I needed just like a nice story, possibly showing a different side of humanity and that we aren't all just real bastards. Cool. That is your ending line. Sick, let's go, let's go, let's go edit this thing. Let's go have like a coffee from KFC is a standard. I mean, hey, it's my last week in this neighborhood, come on. Don't reveal the neighborhood, please. Don't don't send like coordinates. <laughs> Knowing you. <laughs> Remember when I had that curtain open and like you could literally see where I lived? <laughs> because don't even. No, they're gonna go to the old videos. Do it, do it. This is how you get them. This is how you get them to replay all of the old videos. Replay them for the content, not to see where I lived. I mean hey, by the time I post this I'll be out, so um <laughs> good luck with that, whatever the fuck you gauge from them. <sighs> I'm out. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.